Anyway, uh, let's talk about uh, uh, deep learning communications. And uh, so I, I will first talk about uh, uh, actually two categories of work. One is uh, deep learning for physical name processing. Uh, another uh, topic is the resource allocation. I will give a brief overview of our work in each uh, and category. And uh, we started this work and figure out machine learning for um, wireless communications, perhaps uh, something like 20, uh, 2016, about that time. And uh, actually, long before that time, like, uh, like 2010, and my friend Fred Zhuang and uh, already talked to me and mentioned to me, why don't you use the machine learning for for communication system? And uh, by the way, Fred Zhuang is the world leading expert in uh, in uh, speech processing, and uh, he did a lot of fantastic work using machine learning and uh, won like uh, NAE of uh, United States. So. Uh, and so he's a machine, he's an expert in machine learning. And he mentioned to me about 10 years ago, and I didn't do that until 2016. And so we collaborated to try to use uh, this uh, neural network uh, for, for, uh, uh, machine, uh, for signal, uh, for, for, for uh, communication system. I'm, I'm not going to talk about it too much about motivation, because nowadays everybody is doing machine learning for, for, for Wireless communication, you should know the motivation uh, well. I believe to like okay, and let's talk about uh, communication. I mean, put it in name front. I mean, I a little bit hesitant to do that. Well, I can uh, hear something. Can you hear something? Somebody talking. So anyway, it stopped. Anyway, uh, let's first talk about the uh, communication system. This is a very simplified. Uh, block diagram of a communication system. We have a receiver, we have a transmitter. In between them, we have channel. And uh, for wireless channel, usually uh, instantaneous channel information is unknown. And uh, when we figure out the machine learning for uh, and communication systems, we can use the uh, machine learning to substitute the individual uh, block here. For example, use the neural network for channel estimation and they use the neural network for decoding and so on. And uh, we can, on the other hand, we can merge all of these uh, blocks and form a transmitter neural network. And similarly, we form a receiver neural network, which is something called an end-to-end -end, uh, wireless communication system. This is a kind of the potential applications of the uh, uh, deep learning for for wireless communication systems, I mean, physically uh, designed. And for detail regarding it, those uh, kind of survey, can, you can see the uh, uh, those two articles here. And uh, if we use uh, like a block, use uh, like a diagram, we can see the, um, we can divide them into block structure and where we keep her, uh, each individual blocks, coding, decoding, modulation, and demodulation. On. And then we can use just to use a data driven, uh, use the data to training a model to perform certain functions, such as signal detection and uh, like uh, uh, channel estimation and so on. And uh, inside of this block structure, there is something called a model driven. What's that mean? Model driven means that when you are trying to use the machine learning and neural network. Uh, for a special function wireless communication systems, for example, you use that one for the MIMO signal detection. And you can use generally machine learning together with the existing machine, uh, machine uh, together with the existing wireless expert knowledge and to uh, simplify the neural network. One of the examples is uh, uh, when, whenever we do the iterative detection for, for MIMO system, and uh, you can use that uh, MIMO like iterative detection structure and unwrap that structure, and you add uh, uh, some um, trainable parameters. So this is, this is something called a deep unfolding, and uh, I will talk about one example in that respect. 
And also, we can think about the end-to-end -end system. As I said, you use one neural network for the transmitter, another one for the for the receiver, and then in the training neural network. This is a, a purely data-driven and it's end-to-end -end model. And there are something in between. And our first work is going in between them. I will give us three examples in the subsequent talk. And then, and of course, one is the, the deep learning can be also used uh, in resource allocation. Actually, resource allocation is a very hot risk topic uh, back to about uh, pre pre perhaps in the previous 15 years. And uh, basically, the traditional method is uh, we usually formulate the problem, the optimization pro problem, and then try to solve the optimization problem when we get the solution then you will get the optimum resource allocation. And uh, most of the cases, the optimization pro problem is NP harder, and uh, it's uh, uh, very hard, even not, not impossible, to find the optimum solution, so to, to uh, have a trade-off between the performance and, uh, and uh, complexity, you don't even get the suboptimal solution. And if we think about the machine learning for one is resource allocation, there are two ways as I said. And one way is that you still formulate the problem into optimization problem, but you use the machine learning uh, to simplify the optimization problem and to, to improve the performance of the, uh, of the system. On the other hand, uh, you can directly use uh, uh, machine learning for resource allocation. For example, you can use uh, like a deep reinforcement learning for resource allocation. I guess nowadays most of the people trying to investigate in, in that way. And also you, are, you also can use something like uh, graph embedding um, for wide technique scheduling. And in this talk, I will give this uh, uh, two examples, but uh, I will ignore the work in uh, deep learning system in the method to solve optimization problem and uh, we have we have done some work in that area if you are interested and um, let's talk about the first week this is our uh, first work this is something uh, uh, the first thing we have done when we are we're trying to figure out how can we combine uh, machine learning and uh, in physical near communication i started with the topic i familiar most that is uh, to use that uh, uh, um, method for the channel estimation and the signal detection in OFDM systems that I done the, uh, about uh, 20 years ago. And uh, back to the like uh, uh, 2016, and there's a limited work using uh, machine learning for, uh, for communication. And, uh, and for example, back to uh, nine, 1990s, there are some work in using that uh, machine learning for equalization. And also at that time, there is some work uh, about, about uh, using uh, machine learning for decoding. But uh, other than those work, there is no other significant work. And uh, so this is a work I have done about uh, 20 years ago, which is basically a robust channel estimation for OFDM system. And uh, this is uh, just a standard OFDM system. Let's look at the receiver. At the re receiver, we, there are two things. One is the channel estimation, and uh, we estimate the channel parameters using the pilots, uh, which is known to the transmitter and the receiver. And uh, with the estimated channel, then we recover the, the transmitted data, and which is a, a very uh, simple uh, signal detection in OFDM system. So if we use the uh, machine learning and uh, we're trying to combine that two blocks into one neural network, in that case, the, the neural network input is the uh, received OFDM block corresponding to the pilot and the received data block. And the output of this neural network is directly the, the, the decoded data, the, I mean, de detected data. And uh, we just uh, using that uh, pilot OFDM block as an input so that uh, this neural network can learn what uh, uh, channel information, and uh, but implicitly, not explicitly. And uh, with the information, this neural network can uh, 
perform a signal detection. That, that's a, a, a just a critical idea we're trying to figure out. And, uh, and we tried it. And uh, for the training of the neural network, uh, and uh, everything is very similar to the traditional uh, machine learning neural network training approach. Our north function is the L2 north. It's very uh, common. So you can need, you can need a north. So, and after we tried that, and we found some uh, performance, and there are two cases we are thinking about, and uh, all the uh, block, WebDM block are pilots, so there are 16 pilots, and if there are 16 pilots, in that case, the channel estimation problem can be regarded as a linear problem, because you are trying, you have uh, 64 data and 64 positions. For each position, you just try to figure out uh, whether the or what's the size of this value, and it's a linear problem. And so, estimation in that case, the minimum mean square estimation should be the uh, optimal. And in that case, you would compare the performance of the three uh, as uh, channel estimation. One is the least square channel estimation, and the other two are. Uh, 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 LMSE estimation and uh, and the machine learning based approach. And from this figure, we can see the machine learning based approach is very close to the minimum mean square error approach. And uh, of course, you and uh, at the very beginning, we're trying to figure out why the raster difference is not as as good as the uh, as the uh, uh, least mean square approach. And uh, we, we spent a lot of time in, in trying to figure out the gap. And at least, in my opinion, should be as good as uh, a least mean square error approach because uh, we use the neural network, we should be able to uh, like approximate any function uh, if the neural network size is reasonable. And but later on, through analysis, we found that this gap is, is actually harder to, 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 to reduce. So anyway, and if we reduce the pilot from 64 to 8, and we found one interesting phenomenon. In that case, if there you have only one eight, only eight uh, pilots, then the channel estimation problems is not cannot be uh, formulated as a linear problem anymore. It's a kind of a non-linear problem, and you have a uh, only finite number of uh, taps, and you have to estimate the delay and, and uh, a tap again. And uh, in that case, the, 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 the relationship is nonlinear relationship. In that case, the, the machine learning approach uh, can, can do a very good job. And of course, we have a certain performance degradation, but the, the, the minimum mean square approach and a least square approach it, it, it doesn't work at all. And uh, we also tried another situation. And uh, for example, if the system, UFDM system has no uh, cyclic prefix, and uh, and all you we have a uh, nonlinear amplifier, and uh, we we all find the uh, uh, neural network can address those uh, situations very well. But the uh, re the existing approach will have problem. And for details also regarding those figures, you can see my uh, publications. And the second. Uh, issue where I, I'm going to talk about it. We call it a model driven deep learning in fit kernel communications. And the basic idea for those kind of approach is use the expert uh, knowledge together with the machine learning to reduce the size of the neural network or the complexity of the training. And so for the basic ideas or for the not uh, for the survey you can see this paper we call it a, a model driven uh, deep learning for fit kernel computation but later on we found that there are you will look at the archive there are not yet a group of the papers and uh, doing things using existing model together with machine learning especially the found almost all iterative approach can be like uh, can can be combined with machine learning easily. In that case, they call it a deeper uh, a deeper unfolding and uh, or deeper unwrapping. Now, let's look at. I just give an example here, and this is a, a very typical mammal detection problem. You you we assume we know the channel and. Uh, because if we don't know channel, we can estimate, for example, using the neural network to deal with that. And uh, you know the channel, and this is 
x to be the vector is attached to the vector and a is an unknown noise and y is the received signal and then we're trying to figure out uh, what is the transmitted vector x based on the observation y and of course channel is not and uh, typically we have three methods one is the optimal detection method and the map method and uh, which is equivalent to maximum likelihood detector if uh, the, 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 the x is with the uh, uh, a uniform distribution or each uh, each uh, signal and uh, but the uh, uh, that approach is with higher uh, complexity, especially when the size of the X is very large. And in that case, the complexity exponentially uh, uh, increased with the uh, with the, the size of the X. And now of course, we have the some uh, linear detector like the Rufosi uh, minimum mean square. But they have no complexity if the performance is poor. See, so there are some approaches which uh, with the complexity, uh, very reasonable complexity, but the performance uh, pre approach the, uh, uh, the, the, the optimal detector. Some of them are M AMP and uh, based detector and EP based detector. Perhaps most of you guys know that. And uh, so, for example, a, a AMP approach, which is a kind of the uh, iterative approach. And this is a revised version of AMP approach, which is called OA, OAMP. And uh, the revision for the revision, you can see this paper and uh, published uh, uh, four years ago. And uh, basically, this is a iterative iteration process and we're trying to use the iteration process to implement this integral the signal detection uh, approach and uh, and in this uh, uh, iterative uh, iteration pro process all the parameters are, are deterministic and uh, first step we just unwrapping this uh, this structure and uh, so again for you we follow the original approach and each layer with the have with the same structure, and in this structure, all the parameters are fixed. And uh, and uh, if we are trying to combine this uh, uh, approach with a kind of the machine learning approach, and uh, we can set up a certain, for example, uh, in this case, we set up two and um, uh, trainable uh, parameters when, for each iteration. We call it uh, gamma t and beta t, and then for each uh, iteration, and uh, for the first one, theta one and, uh, and gamma one, and which is different from those in the second iteration or third iteration. So for each time, we have optimum value for that. And uh, you may ask the uh, so why how to get the optimal value for each iteration? Of course, it's impossible to calculate it. You can add it for me, and then you use the machine learning to, to deal with that. You regard this thing as a, as, a, as a neural network, and it's a special neural network. But you uh, you put these parameters as a, you know as a weight, and you you just use the data to train it, and so that you get the optimal value for them, which reminded me of the adaptive signal processing approach, and which people investigated it. About in, in the past 40 years, they're trying to figure out what's the optimal uh, step size should we use. And we all know that at the very beginning, we should use the largest step size so that the algorithm can move. And when the algorithm is approaching to the uh, uh, like the optimal point, we want to reduce the step, step size. And so at the very beginning, larger step size, and but at the end, very small step size. But so people are trying to figure out. That. How can we adjust those step size optimally with the increasing of the iteration? The, 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 uh, uh, we can optimize the performance. Uh, of course, the, the system is usually very complicated. There is no way to, to control this uh, step size uh, at that time. And people try to use exponential decay, step size, whatever. But no optimal. But if you are using machine learning, this problem can be easily solved. You just use the big data to train in that uh, step size, you can get optimal for, for each iteration. 
Anyway, this is a kind of the idea of the deep unwrapping and uh, you have an uh, iterative approach, you unwrap it, you put the several parameters and your training parameter and uh, so that uh, you, you, you optimize the performance. For example, in this algorithm, if you have, have 10, 10 iterations, then you only need 20, 20 parameters to be trained, which is you have much fewer uh, parameters compared with those that using original neural network uh, to, to train for that. So this is a large group of approach, not only for memory detection, can be used for almost all the iterative approach in communication system. And so this is a problem. I have a question just on that one, Jeffrey. Did, yeah. If you guys, I guess here you, for this one, this is this is not your work, is, is, or is this other? This is this your, your work or other guys' work? Uh, this is a work. Uh, it's a. Okay. It's a uh, a co 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 with a student. So okay, okay, okay. But now, so this one, you're you're assuming you know the channel matrix H, so yes. that this one is not. It's just a pure detection problem, not not an estimate. And uh, actually, I he first he wrote a conference paper and uh, so say the the, the the detection and my detection uses uh, using this approach. Yeah. Then I said, well. Uh, can you use a joint detection of the channel estimation and uh, and uh, and uh, using joint estimation and signal detection? And uh, he tried, and uh, at least from his point, he found that uh, um, this joint detection approach uh, can improve the performance a little bit, uh, but uh, there is not much a big performance improvement. Uh, actually, uh, I still don't understand why there is no big performance improvement. And uh, uh, this paper and uh, and uh, we, we said the uh, for 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 a mammal detection, but actually in the paper we said that for joint uh, signal detection and the channel estimation and signal detection, that's what we really did. But the, the joint process, the extra gain from from the joint process is is not as large as I thought. It. So we finally we changed it to mammal detection, and then we, what we're really really doing is. The, yeah, you have results in that paper. You can see joint detection with other ones. What's the performance difference? And yeah. Uh, okay. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, next, present the third work for the feed kernel processing. And uh, this is the performance. And uh, we can see the performance improvement. Uh, we compare the original OIP approach with our machine learning based approach. And uh, Again, we got whatever we get. We have we cannot explain why, and uh, we tried a different uh, like a modulation order Q Q P S K sixteen and uh, uh, sixteen Q M uh, six uh, sixty four Q M, and we found that uh, for the sixteen Q sixteen four uh, six uh, sixteen Q M, the performance improvement is larger, but for the a uh, nor modulation order or higher modulation order, the performance improved is, is not as good as that one, but we don't know why, that's just what we get. Uh, anyway, the uh, the third work and uh, is something like end-to-end -end wireless uh, systems. And uh, here we are trying to use the transmitter to represent the transmitter and a receiver to represent a neural network to represent the receiver. and uh, the problem here is that we don't know the channel, and that's a problem. Because when you design a system, you don't know what is the channel, and uh, and the channel is random and uh, for wireless system. And at the beginning, people try to use the idea for the for the simple channel for the AWGN channel, and uh, the first work is done by Acodia and uh, Hoides. They are, they have a very smart idea. They put this. Uh, uh, the, the, the training of the transmission neural network into a, a, a context of the reinforcement learning. And they use the source data as a, as a, the, as a state of the, of the system. And they use the, uh, the, 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 this uh, detection performance, for example, as a, as a reward. And they're, they're trying to find the neural network to optimize the action, which is the transmitted signal. And then you regard everything else, unknown channel, and the received signal neural network as the as the environment. And you're trying to to figure out what's the optimum uh, 
transmitter signal so that it, it can maximize the reward. That is to say, minimize, for example, minimize bit error rate or minimize the, the, the mean square error of the detection, things like that. So that's a very smart idea. Uh, but the, uh, the two, two problems, one problem is this one can be only used for the uh, the, the simple channel, not like AWGN channel, even for um, even for the uh, fading channel, it's a little bit hard. And then the second problem is the uh, uh, because they use that uh, uh, the source data as a state, so the transmitted symbol cannot be too large. For example, you will transmit 100 bits, which is a very common communication system. The state space will be as large as two, two, two to the power of 100. And that's impossible uh, to, to train. And uh, so at the very beginning, they're trying to design a system like that. They use the, for example, compare the system with the uh, uh, seven four having code. And in that case, you have only uh, four bits, which is two to the power 15 uh, 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 state. And uh, actually, and uh, I, I think in a, in a conference, the, the global in 2018, when I presented this result, my result, and there are a couple of papers in the same section with mine. They are, they are doing a similar thing, but they, they all use the seven for Hamming code because we cannot do that one for for longer uh, uh, like like code words. And uh, so our work re uh, improved the work the, the existing work in two ways. And uh, the first of all, we are trying to use uh, GAN to, to represent a channel by a neural network. And uh, in that case, we have uh, three neural networks in tandem, and then gradient can be transmitted from here to here and to here. In that case, the transmit optimization tends to, to be a, a user like uh, training uh, the neural network issue. The second contribution is uh, actually the, it's a pretty simple idea. Rather than use the fully connected neural network for the, the transmitter or at the receiver, we just uh, use the convolutional neural network at the transmitter and the convolutional network at here. Maybe this one is not a necessary convolutional network, but we use the convolutional network at the receiver. In that case, and uh, even though our source state can be as large as 100, and we bits, then we can easily train this uh, um, convolutional network. And the, 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 the perhaps the, the instinction is something like that. Because we are using convolutional network, which will have some uh, structure, even though you have like uh, 100 bits here, we don't need to, uh, when you're training the receiver or transmit a neural network, uh, it's not necessary for us to see all the different combinations to train a neural network. Only a limited data is enough for us to train a neural network. That's a kind of, the, uh, uh, it's, uh, we can use this one to uh, like, uh, successfully in, improved the, uh, the scalability issue. So by doing this and, uh, and we can find the performance, we compare with the, this is only of course the initial work, this work with the traditional approach, which UFDM plus QM modulation, plus a very popular uh, convolutional code with a soft decision. And uh, we can see when the signal noise ratio is less than 10 dB, the two approaches are pretty close. And however, when the signal noise ratio is over uh, 10 dB, the, the E2E -E -E based approach is, is pretty good. Of course, we also tested the, the other situation like uh, how about the channel statistics uh, is different from the trend uh, channel statistics. And we found that E2E uh, E2E approach is reasonably robust to the channel environment. So that's uh, uh, the all work I have to say, okay, this is a recent work and one of your students are very interested and in how can we, we, we do the uh, end to end without training. And the idea is not, not that uh, hard. And basically this is structure we are using, we are using that, that one, one layer neural network to represent the wireless channel. And uh, here we have a transmitter neural network. We have a receiver neural network. We have a, some specially designed structure and for detail you can see the paper. And the receiver, we have two neural networks. One neural network is to 
uh, like extract the channel char characteristics and uh, from extracted extracted the channel characteristics then we try to the data recovery and uh, and this one when we we design it properly and uh, we don't need the, the uh, pilot and uh, the idea you will look at this uh, uh, constellation the idea is pretty simple because this constellation is not uh, not a symmetric and also it's uh, it's average is is not uh, zero so actually the, even though we, we say we don't need the or it's a pilot free but uh, we are implicitly sending our pilots here but this is designed through machine learning, not through ourselves. Okay. So this is the performance. We compare the performance of this approach. Je and Je 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 Jeffrey, I'm sorry. I just, I just want to understand the, the 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 architecture here a little bit better. So okay. So the first one with the GAN. Can, can you go back to that one? I'm trying to understand what the GAN's doing. The GAN is basically helping you speed up the training by. Is it yes. by, is that the idea that it, that essentially mimics the channel? So then you can you can train um, do a lot of training without actually having to transmit and receive yeah, on the yeah. channel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So but, but, by, yeah, but but this, during the operational phase, you're not using the GAN. Oh, uh, when when it's in you know, a really deployment, of course, the channel is real channel is not GAN anymore. Only we have the transmit and receiver. Right. right? So, so, so you don't use the GAN during the actual operation. You, you just use oh, no, the no, no. This is only on, on the offline pen, only offline pen, and it's just right. like uh, like a, it's a tool to help us to connect to the transmitter and the receiver using a neural network. And, and and how robust is it to the channel changing? I mean, is, we, you know, we've been doing some stuff with this. I was just curious how, how you know do you have to redo this for kind of each different channel like if the if the one of the transmitter or receiver moves you, do you uh, the, the, I think in, in our situation we, we use the like uh, it's not a, for each channel uh, 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 instantaneous channels it's for a big group of channel for example indoor channel outdoor channel and uh, so there are there are not so like in the training phase there are not so different channel files and uh, then we just use those uh, channel. And uh, if we train it this way, it's good for the the whole outdoor channel, no matter which realization it is. Uh, okay. You know. So it has so it's so it's because uh, that's that's what we're seeing too. Yeah. You know, kind of as long as it's chained for the right basic statistics, it can mimic. It, it can. Uh, we we're using it differently, but uh, okay. So it's kind of for a class of channels. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Because yeah, we just use that one for training. Because it's. I guess because we are still using the uh, pilot in this system, so actually the uh, we are using that uh, the 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 the, GAN, the neural network to get the channel statistics, and okay. then with the channel statistics, and uh, together with the perhaps the pilot to the receiver, and uh, we can receiver can figure out what's the okay. channel realization. Yeah. And, and then for the one without pilots, like two slides later, slide 24. This is, this is with the pilot. This is with okay. pilot. Yeah, so, so I think I understand this one now. So for the, the one with the without with without the pilots, the, the this one. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So so what is the channel? So how does like is the channel extractor is this trying to learn like basic is is this is this kind of trying to invert the channel? Is it trying to learn so that, that you have one neural net that's trying to learn the channel and then one neural net that's trying to decode the data. And and so how does this work? Yeah, this yeah. This is different? something like uh, like that. Something similar to that. This is just a mimic. You see, we, we put the multiplication here. It's just like a mimic. We we extract to the channel, but it's uh, it's impli again. It's implicitly extract something. Yeah. So it's kind of like it's 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 sort of like doing a channel inversion or something like that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Maybe we are doing something like uh, just a pass back the channel information to the to the neural network so that it can do the data recovery. And uh, yeah, this is something similar to that, but it is not exactly the channel. We don't okay. know what it is. It's, an, it's learned by, by, by neural network. As long as the, this uh, neural network knows what, what, what is it, it's fine. It's, it's, uh, there is not necessary to have a certain physical insight in that case. 
Well, like, what, well, what's like the loss function? I mean, how do you train this channel extractor to, I mean, what, what, what is it like trying to do? I uh, the question. Frankly speaking, I, I don't remember, but I think it's a minimum mean square error. Uh, either either this one or, or the, the, the the that. Uh, so so do you use like the actual channel labels for like the training? Oh aspect? yes, we 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 use the you we use the expert expert channel label. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Th thanks. I just wanted to try to understand a little bit more what's going on in this architecture that you know seems to work pretty yeah, pretty well. <laughs> uh, I had a question about slide twenty two. Uh, uh, the GAN model. Yes. Yeah, so you, you're providing the transmit signal consists of the transmit pilot signals as input, and you're yes. providing the received pilot signals as a condition. So, I mean, implicitly the channel is already embedded in that, right? So then why do you need a generator? Uh, the channel is, 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 is what, is, is where? I mean, the, the received pilot signals are, you know, some form of HX plus N. And the input transmit pilot signals are X. So I mean, the generator is generally supposed to be given some random seed, you know, which. Uh, uh, okay, this is a philosophy. At the very beginning, uh, of course, when the receiver channel is trained, receiver is trained, right? You have a neural network and uh, you have a training sequence. And because the receiver is trained, the receiver knows the channel statistics together with the pilots. It can interpret uh, what's a what's a what's a what's a channel distortion, and so that they can we can detect the, detect the signal. But uh, at the very beginning, and we are we are talking about the training the, the neural network. So this receiver doesn't know anything about the channel. So we have to train them, and we have to let uh, let the this receiver knows the um, corresponding to certain certain group of channel. How do we decode? Right, so that's why we we need that that one. We need that uh, uh, the neural network because it's, uh, even at the very beginning, you have a way to to train and receive a neural network. Actually, it's always easy because you construct your loss loss function here and then you grade it up approaches to do that. But the training transmitter is a big problem because when you do that, you uh you don't know what's the channel. Channel is random and uh, and uh, there's no way for you. To train to like uh, um, like the past gradient back to the transmitter because your your north function is here and here x is something which uh, doesn't matter right so, so the whole idea is to try training the transmitter neural network because the receiver neural network is easy right and uh, so we come up with uh, this is the uh, one way using reinforcement learning to do that they regard that channel as a as a policy uh, in the reinforcement learning and then train this uh, policy in your network uh, and the using the regard of the channel and the receiver as the environment and this is our way and uh, to use the gan to model the channel as a neural network uh, and so that it can generate uh, the same random uh, signal as the you know as the a uh, real channel and so that uh, we can train right and then you will have three neural networks here in tandem then gradient can be easily pa passed back to all the way to the transmitter mm -hmm. but when okay. we are trying to to use this approach uh, this is just a real channel and this receiver have already learned how to use the uh, Pioneers, distorted pioneers together with the uh, the the channel statistics he remembered to 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 detect the signal. Okay, thank you. Any other no question? No, then I go to next one. Okay, so I go to the uh, resource allocation kind of issue and. Uh, I, I just uh, introduced two, two things briefly, and the way they said uh, based on graph embedding, another one based on the resource allocation. And uh, graph embedding, and uh, uh, of course, it can be also help to, 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 to solve the uh, resource allocation optimization problem. I'm not talking about that one here. So, the uh, just, just omit this kind of the, the overview and uh, so this is a kind of the D2D network and uh, 
the NAFTA side and uh, uh, trying to, to share the channels so that uh, in that case we have interferences from uh, from the D2D pairs, for example, we have a transmitter, we have a receiver here, and this is a D2D pair, this is another one, right? And uh, we assume here we know the, 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 the channel, channel state of situation. Of course, in reality, this is harder. And, uh, but when we do the convert this one to the, uh, you know, to, the, to this, uh, uh, to embed this neural network, this actually is not necessarily the real channel information. It could be the distance between different devices and which can be easily obtained through, uh, through the GPS, let's see. Anyway, and we noticed that, and the, the, this is the transmitter, this is the receiver, and the, it, uh, the, this is the D2D pair. Even this D2D pair, it will receive the interference from the other D2D transmitter. And of course, at the same time, this D2D transmitter will generate interferences to other D2D receiver. So we can, we can simplify or using a, a graph to express this neural network. But this graph is the, uh, see something called uh, like a direction graph. It's not like the graph from A to B, the same as, as B to A. So from, for example, from D4 to D1, which is the channel uh, state information uh, or distance, which can be also used to express the, the inference itself. And uh, because this H41 and H, 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 H14 is very different because H41 is the, from the this D, this receiver R4 to T1, and H41 is from the uh, uh, the the, uh, the the H14 is from is from the other other way from this transmitter to this receiver. So they are different. It's a directional graph, and if we express this one as a direction graph, we can uh, derive some uh, parameter, extra some parameter, uh, like a uh, some feature, uh, like uh, to extract some feature to, uh, you know, for us to make decision whether we should transmit or which uh, which frequency should we transmit. And uh, we, we call that one mu. That one has something to do with, with the several uh, issues with the, uh, uh, with the, 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 the weight of, of the XV with the, its neighbors, uh, 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 information and uh, with the interference information, and uh, this is uh, the, 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 the this is uh, the metric of the uh, the, 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 the adjacent uh, knots, right? And we're trying to use the to solve this equation here. Of course, it's a it's a sigma function, and uh, we choose the sigma to be a renewal function. It could be uh, other uh, other like uh, any like sigmoid function for me. And uh, we try to use iterative approach to uh, to to up to extract this uh, this uh, like uh, uh, metric. From this metric, we can determine uh, which frequency to transmit and uh, use which power. This is uh, the basic idea actually. And uh, and how to design this one? It's a little bit tricky to try and and see the performance. And uh, perhaps yeah yeah yeah. You need some kind of the uh, uh, like uh, feeling plus some, some knowledge in perhaps in graph embedding to do that. And uh, this is uh, the, the, the performance and, uh, and perhaps the number of the training base. And uh, from here we can see the, even though we use this approach and uh, which is uh, pretty similar, you need all, only 200 training, training data to, to, to train the neural network and you can have uh, like uh, accuracy of about uh, 80% and uh, sound rate is reach uh, about uh, like 93% uh, of the optimal one. And also, and uh, we can increase the size and we increase the size of the network and the performance uh, variation is not that big. We can always get a very good uh, performance. This is a kind of the, the you use the, 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 the graph embedding. It's a, this is a simple idea and uh, to do that. And the next work is, any questions? Okay, next, next one is about uh, based the, 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 the results, sorry, I wrote it. It's based on the reinforcement learning. 
Actually, this is actually our first work in using uh, uh, using deep reinforcement learning for resource allocation. I, I guess this is one of the earliest work because uh, at least we didn't see much work using the uh, reinforcement learning for resource allocation before that time. And uh, right now, of course, there are perhaps millions of papers <laughs> on the, in that work, uh, various resource allocation uh, for uh, work for the. Uh, for the resource allocation, but anyway, we put that uh, uh, in, into uh, into a like uh, context of the uh, uh, vehicle network, and we have two kind of the links. One is the vehicular to vehicular links. Another one vehicular to infrastructure links, and uh, and uh, V2I links transmit uh, uh, regular data, and uh, which is uh, with a higher rate and. Uh, a channel usually is reasonable, and a V2V usually uh, transmits a very uh, like uh, important data regarding the each uh, each vehicle's uh, information. For example, transmit a safety and emergency related message, and in that case, its delay requirement is very high, and the reliability requirement is very high. So that's the kind of the we, we assume this V2V. Uh, perhaps the shear the, 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 the frequency set with V2I, that therefore there may be interference. And uh, and uh, because this problem related to the latency, and uh, you whenever we related to latency, it's, it's uh, pretty hard to use the typical uh, resource allocation approach to do that. Because usually we the, the relationship between the resource, resource assignment and the latency delay and delay is is pretty complicated. There is no analytical formula which makes the optimization pretty hard. And then we put this in the uh, uh, reinforcement learning context. Uh, basically, uh, we, we set up uh, the agent. It could be very uh, retwining and the environment uh, and uh, the everything outside of retwining, wireless channels, all the reconnect situation. And uh, the reward. Uh, this is a tricky issue. Divided can be there are three parts. One part is the capacity of the v 2 link. Another part is the capacity or transmission rate of the v 2 v 2 v link. And then the third one is something related to the delay. And then we use three parameters here to balance their weights. Right? You 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 adjust the weights to get whatever you want to perform in, optimal performance. And uh, so if we use machine learning, we can easily like consider this delay issue. But if we are use a traditional method, it's, uh, it's uh, pretty hard. And this is a reward of function design. And the received uh, like, uh, like action is a transmitted signal and uh, frequency and, and the power. And uh, then when, whenever you have a decision, then, then you you know this environment will generate another like a uh, like a state which including the 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 the, the 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 everything and also the generator reward and then we optimize this policy so that uh, we can minimize this uh, uh this reward function this is a kind of the uh the, the idea and uh so this is a performance. The, since since here is that here we said every every little winning. It's a pretty tricky. And the, at the very beginning, when, when my students are doing this uh, reinforcement learning work, and they're they're making all the uh, little little winning to to act at the same time. So everybody when they do the training, everybody is uh, you know is changing their states at the same time. And if you found that the performance improvement is very limited and performance is not so good, and later on we figured out if you you let all the uh, v2 v2 winning act at the same time, the problems tends to be the multiple agent uh, uh, reinforcement and learning, and the system is not just uh, stationary, and uh, you it's hard to to guarantee the to reach the optimal you know to 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 reach the optimal. Uh, of the of the of the system, so I said, uh, well, instead of you, you every v two v link uh, to take action at the same time, you all the all the v two v link uh, take actions like uh, randomly. In that case, the 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 chance for them to take the action at the same time is uh, is 
is very small and also in that case the, the system can be regarded as the uh, uh, like a, a single agent issue so whenever this v2v link uh, they, 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 they take the action they observe what's the result of the previous v2v links and when he he she he, he, he gets his policy the other other the subsequent uh, v2v link can see the consequence of his action and then take the action like uh, consequently so this is uh, important don't don't do that uh, at the same time it will then this is a performance of course performance is good i'm i'm not going to talk too much about the performance and uh, and if we do want them to make decisions at the same time then you uh, uh you have to use some kind of some tricky it's a tricky issue yeah you have to train them at the same time that is to say when you train them and uh, so the we, we each individual uh like uh, agent can see the the environment of other agent and in that case if you will train them jointly it is it's, it's equivalent to say the each agent knows the policy of other agent uh, but here it's just not the policy of the of the of the object doesn't know the uh, know the the choice not doesn't know the action of the other agent it, they are still issue but it's uh, the chance is reduced I, I you I used to use the example of the of the matching if you have two boys and two girls and uh, and uh, the, the boy is into there well he likes uh, this girl, but he doesn't know if the other boy like it and if there is a conflict scene or not. And uh, and uh, but if they take this action at the same time, there's no way to 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 like uh, you know to uh, to avoid the confliction. But if the one boy knows the other boy is uh, the taste, that could be different because uh, the, the he knows the other boy knows the, the girl with the short hair. And uh, and if there are two girls, one with short hair, one with no hair, then the the decision is easy. There is no uh, everybody get everybody is happy. And of course, there are still a chance. How about if two girls are both short hair, and you have a collision again? So that's why when each agent knows the policy of the other agent, it help it can help uh, reduce the collision. But it, we cannot uh, like uh, totally. Uh, avoid the collision and uh, by doing this and uh, we can improve the performance uh, significantly i'm not going to talk too much about it and another way is the well still talk to a uh, vehicle network and uh, and if we do have a centralized uh, future uh, centralized uh, like uh, client which uh, uh, agent which assign the resource to everybody and so each vehicle need to uh, you know send the, 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 the its information to the center and so that you can make decision. And then the question is that those uh, environmental information is, is pretty big and it's hard to do that. And then we are trying to figure out how can we compress those uh, environmental information and we just send the compressed information to the center uh, so that uh, the uh, to reduce the, the the overhead of the of the information and transmission of feedback. Whenever this uh, uh, this central neural network make decision, it can inform all the vehicles so which frequency should you use, which frequency. That's a pretty uh, interesting idea. And uh, if we are doing joint joint, you know, join the training of this neural network, we can successfully reduce the, the overhead for the uh, environment, uh, you know, for the environment, uh, the, the, the uh, information transmission. Another idea, well, this, this neural network need to, you know, uh, feedback in, to tell each, each user which frequency, which power to use. And uh, here is a, another issue and, uh, and uh, most of the information about the about the decision, which frequency to choose, which uh, power to choose, most of the information is still the local here. And uh, for this neural network, can we just feedback some like uh, a little bit intermediate information 
so that uh, those in intermediate information together with those local information, we can make the a correct decision so that uh, the system is stable. Because there are two extreme cases. One extreme case is uh, it, here, this neural network tells every agent which frequency or which uh, power you should choose. And in that case, there is no collision, we can guarantee because it's a centralized decision. And uh, another case is uh, uh, we feel back nothing. And it's like uh, you make decision yourself, each, 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 uh, each knock on your network and make decision yourself. In that case, of course, you can never avoid a decision. And the question is uh, how much, much information should we transmit to the receiver? We can avoid uh, the system unstability, avoid a collision. And this one is, we don't know. We're trying to figure out, it seems a hard problem because maybe we need to transmit one bit or two bit information, then the system will be stable and, uh, but we don't know. Yeah, this I is a- uh, I'm sorry, I, I have a question about this one and the previous one actually. Um, it, if it is to um, make the system just centralized, then um, you mean this one? Yes. About okay. Uh, is it to um, make centralized the system? Can you repeat again? I mean, um, I think this uh, method is to um, centralize the system, right? Yeah, this is a, this is a centralized system. Yes, yes. yes that, that, and, uh, I wonder. I wonder what is the difference between yeah, yeah. The, just uh, scheduling each um, networks a you know specific resource and time. Otherwise, in order to avoid collision, then uh, each um, local network should be able to select their own resources and then in order to avoid collision, they may need to sense then in that case, I, uh, I'm very curious about if you uh, did some uh, work uh, like non-simultaneous transmission. I think everything comes from um, the fact that you assume all the local network um, uh, perform the simultaneous decision and transmission. Yes. Right. And uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. And actually, the yeah, you're right. And then this is uh, actually the centralized system. And if we compress the information here and send to here, and then each one send the like a decision to to the user. But if we we don't send the like uh, the original decision, we're trying to send one or two bits uh, uh, information here. Then you this one. One or, bit, one or two bit of information combined with the local information to make decision here. In that case, we can perhaps further, re, further re, reduce the, 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 the transmission rate here. And uh, at that time, the, 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 the mitigate the, 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 the collision. But so we, we have this kind of the simulation results, but we cannot get the theoretical uh, performance and analysis. It, it seems hard. Okay. Okay. Okay, that's what we are we have done and basically and we talked about uh, physically uh, things. We talk about the resource allocation kind of the issue and uh, and also the, for the future perhaps the record of the things. For example, we, we need to further investigate this uh, E2E issue and. Uh, to address some issue like a cursing, curse of the dimensionality, and especially to the transmitter, how to address it. And uh, uh, and we, we don't know how much this this method can be better than the traditional method in terms of the performance and the complexity. Because this is the initial work, it's, it's not fair to compare with the traditional approach, which has been here for about uh, uh, 40 years or, or, or long time. And also for the model driven deep learning approach, because uh, we need to think about the trade off from uh, performance, complexity, and training efficiency, and so on. There are fair, many things we need to, to address. And uh, for the multiple agent deep reinforcement learning, which could be uh, like uh, 
in the future system, especially if you have an Internet of Things system. And actually, you have too much data to, to extend it. If you want to perform a very a nice uh, resource allocation, and uh, how do we address that? How do the basically it's a non stationary to environment among multiple agencies. And this, the issue is uh, in the current like, machine learning society and the multiple agent, there is no communication among different uh, agents. And if we know certain communication among those agents, how can we use that information to reduce the non-stationary non issue? And if that is the case, how much information do we need? And which information should we, we, we communicate among different multiple agents? Those are all problems related to uh, my previous research. Another issue we are trying to do is the uh, something called a semantic communication. And uh, so far we are doing like, uh, try to address the transmission of symbols, which is like uh, uh, just uh, everybody is doing. And we are, if we considering the, the semantic meaning, the meaning of the transmission content, uh, perhaps the things will be different. And we can use that correlation to significantly improve the efficiency of the communication system. And this, and of currently we have we are addressing the level one. There are another two level. Perhaps we we started to see in the previous uh, uh, study. Actually, the when Shano has a has a like a short book with his friend Weaver, and uh, Shannon addressed this uh, transmission of symbol and this the information theory. And the Weaver and I think second part is the Weaver's work. And we talk about the three three level. We talk about the semantic communication and also effects of semantic communication. But at that time, because it's hard to have a mathematical model to model the semantic meaning and. Uh, uh, so in the past, uh, perhaps 70 years, uh, even though from time to time, some people are trying to, to address the issue, there is no progress. But uh, nowadays, we have the neural network. Uh, we, we don't need a mathematical model. Perhaps with the neural network, we can successfully address the issue. When I noticed uh, in the previous years, uh, some work uh, from the image processing society, they, they, they did that. Uh, but for the speech and but for the text transmission, what should we can do? And uh, we have uh, some initial work on how to transmit, uh, for example, in this, we're trying to talk about how to transmit uh, uh, text. Uh, we address about the sentence. And uh, we have uh, just uh, some initial work. And, uh, uh, but it, see, it seems this direction is pretty, uh, you know, is very interesting and where we have uh, very big performance improvement. I can, of course, there are lots of risks that need to be done in this area. And another issue is uh, not as we are talking about the uh, applied machine learning for, for communication systems, but uh, and um, many people said, well, in the future, uh, perhaps uh, not only machine learning for communication and uh, maybe like a communication for machine learning, because we use machine learning everywhere and how to connect the data, maybe using wireless communication to collect the data. And this is pretty much a case. So we come up with the, uh, some like, uh, you know, the privacy issue, uh, issues like that. And so we, uh, several years ago, people proposed the federal learning and, uh, and this is different from the other learning. And not only it's a, it's a new kind of the machine learning approach, and it depends on the communication. And uh, in that case, how can we, we figure out uh, the relationship uh, between federated learning or in general distributed learning with communication? And it's uh, also a very interesting research topic.